We're here. Yay. Thursday. Week went by fast. Do you guys have any questions? Things you wanted to cover specifically? Um, I have a new client who I would love to pick your brain about. Um, sure. I might, I honestly, I, I think I might like to do like a <clears throat> session where you come in as well on Zoom. Okay, um, yeah. A lot going on. Um, and she originally wanted to come to Synergy to see you. So, um, okay. but right. she's got like, I mean, it's, uh, I, I saw her last week um, and she really wanted to focus on her ankle first, which I was like, all right, sure. We'll start with the feet and go up <laughs> because she's got a lot of other stuff going on, but it's like the ankle, um, she, I think was really active when she was younger and had rolled it a few times um, and went hiking recently and got it all flared up. Um, but it's that whole side where her ankle is the problem. Um, her knee doesn't quite track right. Her hip doesn't track right. And she's also got some, like she's seen a pelvic floor PT. She's got some stuff going on there. She recently mm -hmm. had abdominal surgery. She's got whiplash. Mm -hmm. She like there's a lot. <laughs> she she could be on. a project, um, yeah. and probably yeah. too much to really tackle right now. But I I might email you separately okay. about her. Yeah. Um. But I don't know. I guess. Uh. We. I mean, we've talked about the hip, ankle, knee alignment and kind of how that all feeds in together before anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. a topic we want to go over again or if Allegra, if you have other things you want to. Uh, well, I, I just had, um, I just had one, well, actually, I guess two questions. Yeah. Um, but just about the, uh, the young girl that I'm seeing on Saturday. Mm -hmm. you know, which is, yeah. And then, um, our older client Genevieve that we share. Um, so I guess first the older client, um, I know, so this, you know, he's a, he's a golfer, right. And I'm wondering because of his stenosis, um, I guess I was just thinking, you know, because of the way he's kind of rotated or kind of to that right side a little bit, um, would something like, a gentle, I was thinking of like a gentle twisting, like old man at the gym. Is that, is that, is that just like off the cards because of the twisting aspect of it? No, it's not actually. Okay. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, I, that short box series, mm -hmm. I often teach people as a warm up for golf. Mm. So y they can stand with their golf club overhead or behind. That's why you have the golf clubs in the studio. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, also so people can show me what their golf swing looks like. Okay. But also, you know, they hate it because it's a putter in there and they're like, it's a putter. What am I doing with a putter? I'm like, no, it's, it doesn't matter. You don't have to hit a ball. I just wanted to see what you look like when you're holding a golf club. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, but he, you, that is a really nice warm up because they can do it slowly, right? The body needs time to move slowly before they go and like <laughs> hit their, <clears throat> ball really hard and fast and uh you can have them warm up to both sides with rotation mm -hmm. and up and over a barrel so really to avoid with stenosis is extension right so that's really the thing that gets if they have a lateral for foraminal stenosis then maybe going to one side a lot will close down that foramen a lot, especially if they end up extending while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to think, so warming up and working there and strengthening in that is great. They should be not symptomatic though, when they're doing it. And then to unwind or to help somebody with stenosis, it's the opposite of extension. Basically it's flexion. So flexing, and you could add flexion with some rotation, like child's pose with hands to one side or cat with hands on one side of the Cadillac bar, if you use the Cadillac for it. So you can, you can do um, 
that sort of adding a little rotation into the flexion. But if you think, so we'd like, for stenosis, we like flexion, but I don't typically do loaded flexion. Right. Do you remember why you guys know why not to do loaded flexion with stenosis? Besides the fact that most people who have stenosis or significant stenosis are older, um, and when they're older, they're more likely to have osteoporosis. So it's besides that, do you remember what stenosis actually is or how it happens a lot of times? Isn't the, you answered any, the disc degeneration? <laughs> Not, not quite, not quite, but you're not totally wrong, right? Yeah, the, so, um, is, isn't it where like part of the, it's not part of the disc, is it that, that comes out the back and that's a pinching? No, because I- um, So that's a herniation, exactly. So stenosis itself is bony overgrowth, right? right? Either around the central, in the central canal, which would be central stenosis, or in the exiting holes, right? The foramen, or then we call it foraminal stenosis. And the, the nerves that are exiting are your peripheral nerves, or your muscular nerves, right? So people get pain down the legs and down the buttock and the legs and from uh, foraminal stenosis on one side. If if the central cord is being compressed, they can have bilateral symptoms. But if central cord is being compressed, that could be quite dangerous because they can actually, if, if it's bad, they actually have to go in surgically and open it up because people can lose function, right, from central stenosis. It's even worse if it's in the cervical spine because if you remember the spinal cord, right, it comes obviously from the head down and sends all the messages. So if you're having compression high up, it can affect, it usually affects the arms. So symptoms could be arms, but it can block transmission of information down to the lower body. So we had a client years ago that had to have a four level cervical fusion because of cervical stenosis, right? Because they had to open it up the central cervical stenosis. So they had to go in and open up the space in the vertebra and they just fused everything to make sure that her cord would be safe, her spinal cord would be safe. Hmm. So when stenosis can happen though, stenosis isn't really a diagnosis in and of itself. I don't remember what her situation was, why that happened to her. I don't remember if there was a car accident or something that set it off. But a lot of people end up with stenosis post disc problem or injury. So disc injury is contraindicated for loaded flexion, mm. right? So if they had, you don't always know what the cause was for their stenosis, especially in an elderly, elder person. So if you're then loading in flexion, and the cause for the stenosis was the loaded flexion. You're, they're also gonna be symptomatic in loaded flexion, but they won't be symptomatic while you're doing it because it's more disc related. They're gonna be symptomatic the next day. Mm. So they'll feel fine while you're loading them in flexion and then they'll feel really bad the next day. So I tend to stay away from loaded flexion and do unloaded flexion just to be extra careful. But really, loaded flexion is actually not contraindicated for stenosis. Extension is. So, um, but I flexion helps relieve stenosis. And if you look at somebody with the with stenosis, what does their posture look like? They're kind of forward a little bit. Yeah, because they're making space they're opening up their vertebra and making space. It's more comfortable. If they have to go up and get into their normal curve, they feel like they they get compression sometimes. Mm. So they go to that more rounded back place. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I was just asking because um, 
in the, the mat manual about the rotation, it just said the rotation can irritate the facet joints and increase symptoms and inflammation. So that's why I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. So rotation, so facet joint dysfunction, do you want to talk about that for a second or is that overkill? It's different than stenosis. The, um, right. And it, because they, that's, that's, it just, they get over irritated when they, the turning. So that's why you don't want to turn with or rotate with someone with facet syndrome, especially right. in the like, lumbar region. Right. So facet syndrome, do you know what it is? Do you remember what it is? Not, I would, I would feel embarrassed to say because I don't remember. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> Genevieve, do you remember or you want me to remind? Um, I'll probably need a reminder, but is it, it's when they're kind of rubbing against each other, right? And it's causing that. Yeah. Yeah. It can be rubbing. Absolutely. So one vertebra above the contact points of the vertebra above and below, right? Are the facet joints. So we have one on each side and every vertebra has an upper facet of facet joints and a lower set of facet joints. So if we were going to name the facet joint, we would see, say the L3, 4 left facet joint, right? Because that's, or we would say if it was the lower one, we'd say the L4, 5 facet joint. So you know which one it is. Otherwise you, you couldn't say the L4 facet because you don't know if it's the upper or the lower. Yeah. Connection to the vertebra above or below. So what happens is there's something, a lot of times with facet joint syndrome, the joint is stuck. The facet joints didn't articulate properly and they're stuck. So you go try and go into rotation and it's not moving. The vertebra is not moving. And so they try and go into rotation and they hit this hard end stop. They, they can't go and it's painful. So um, it's actually more common than disc injury. It's one of the most common things that goes wrong in the back. So more common than disc injury, um, but less, less, I think it's easier to get over, but it can be really repetitive. So rotation into that side just irritates it and inflames it and makes it feel not good mm -hmm. if it's stuck. So someone needs to get in there and unstick it usually. So that's why rotation with facet joint, you, they'll be able to rotate to one side, but they wouldn't be able to rotate back to the other. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Thank you for that. Yes. You're welcome. Um, yeah. And I guess just the other thing I was just thinking about her, you had suggested, um, you know, things to kind of keep it fun, uh, knee stretch on the reformer. And I was thinking, you know, knee stretch, I mean, I haven't re-looked at my notes right now, but, um, in neutral, right. Because yeah, or uh, okay, so, hard for her. great. Let's give Genevieve a little background into this person. So this is a young 15 year old who has a disc injury uh, that has become sort of a chronic thing. So it was maybe a year ago that she had the disc injury discovered and ha is not active at all and has quit all was a horseback rider fell off the horse. A few times they think, you know, it was over repetitive falling off the horse. Um, did some gymnastics as a little kid. And then after she stopped horseback riding because of her back, she really hasn't done anything and she's still in pain. So um, she is coming in for really core strengthening, core work. Her mom does Pilates, her doctor recommended it. So we're trying to work with her now interesting you know if when you can talk you can talk about different stages of disc injuries if somebody's really acute in the disc injury any movement is going to hurt whether that's flexion or extension uh, it will hurt so somebody who has a acute disc injury you're going to probably want to keep them in neutral at first while you're doing movement Right, just to keep them safer. So that even re that even means no coccyx curl. 
when they're that acute. A coccyx stroke can aggravate some people with disc injuries. So if you get a client that says, it hurts when I do coccyx curl, they're just too, things are too irritated back there. There's too much inflammation, too much irritation for the coccyx curl yet. But coccyx curl is usually okay. And when you do coccyx curl for somebody with a disc injury, always the language around it should be creating space and length. You're creating space between your vertebra for that disc to relieve itself, right? Mm -hmm. So it, you never want them to bear down, push hard to get their back to the floor because that's, and rounding their back that way because that's just gonna put the vertebra towards each other and squash the disc that's already hurting, right? So let's say if, so if this young woman is feeling discomfort in an unloaded round back position, like knee stretch round back, which is essentially your cat, then you would work her in neutral. If she can tolerate the round back in that position, it's actually safe for her. It should not make her disc issue worse, but you'll have to know if, she, if it bothers her or not. Yeah, I'll just, I'll and, the, and the, yeah, so the questions are, can you do child's pose? Can you do um, cat? Have you done cats on the mat? So if she can do child's pose and she can do cats on the mat, then she can do round back version of knee stretch. If those bother her, then you're ex exactly right. Neutral spine only for everything she does, everything in neutral spine. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah. just getting to, you know, that was the first time that I worked with her and I was just getting to know her. We, we just did things on supine. We didn't do anything like on quadruped. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll, now since I have some more information and um, just yeah. go forward with, you know, doing some cat and quadruped and stuff like that. Yeah. So the idea, again, with anybody with a disc injury, right, usually extension work can help the disc injury feel better. So it's because most disc injuries are posterior, right, and a little bit lateral usually. Mm -hmm. So if you put them in prone and do a little extension work, that actually often helps. So that would be some great work to start doing glute series for low back with put the spine in a bit of extension. Granted, you're always cueing that support. It's not that you want them to get lazy and just flop, right? There's no flopping, as you know, but um, sometimes that extension can help because it opens the front of the vertebra. And so maybe it gives the disc a little room to reduce into the, its space a little bit better. Right. Um, so yeah, you great can- point, the front, the front of the vertebrae too, because I always think of oh, extension in the back of the vertebrae, but that's, yeah, that's a great point. Thinking of that mm -hmm. other side too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, so extension work would be great. And then you could do, so usually the progression is neutral to extension to flexion. And again, the, any flexion work, the idea is creating space. You're just tractioning with that flexion work. So it's not about how round she can get, it's about how much space she can, she can take from the tail up her spine, like how much space she can create in her body rather than thinking of how round the back can get. That's a different thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. We're trying to create length. Yes. Right. So you might not look for a super round back position. You might just look for something that looks like she's just on stretch and that really nice, you're getting a nice length through the spine. Okay. That's more what you're going to look for. All right. Yeah. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, it just gives yeah. me just wanted to get some more information about that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to hear about Genevieve yeah. client. Okay, Genevieve, go. Do we want to do we want to talk about foot knee hip alignment? <laughs> uh, we can actually I have one more question about our shared elder client. Um, okay. And it's just it's. I mean, I think I know the answer, but his hands are seeming more inflamed again. Um, mm -hmm. He's still using the topical cream that's helpful, but uh, I'm wondering if I should start incorporating more work for his hands or if that's going to be, if that's going to make them more inflamed. Yeah, it's a hard call. Um, they're getting, they get more inflamed when he does a lot of gripping work. Um, so but typically, 
getting blood flow in and out of the area is a good idea. So getting back to the little balls, light squeezing, um, even wrist motion, gentle, right? Gentle wrist motion. Um, trying to think about, uh, he has a tendency to overwork, to be too strong when he does things. So doing them lightly and maybe reminding him about the hot colds baths for his hands. Mm. He and I talked about that a while ago. So hands and feet ankles are great things to, to use the hot cold bath, turn back and forth between a hot cold bath to help pump blood in and out of the area. So basically they get a warm bathtub and put some water in it. And then they get a tub of cold water and throw like six or seven ice cubes in there. And they just transition a minute in hot, a minute in cold, and usually do about five cycles. And I usually tell people to end in the cold if they're inflammatory, because they're typically inflammatory to just cool things off. So for hands and feet, it seems to work really well to just get the, you're getting vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Um, and so it helps get those veins which don't have a muscle pump inside to pump blood back to where we're, we're using that as the muscle pump instead of the actual muscle motion as much to try and help clear some of the inflammation away. So you might remind him about that as well. And then um, he can self massage the hands too. He knows how to do that, but maybe needs a reminder and the compression gloves. Mm -hmm. Keeping them warm and supple though is really good. So light squeezing, light wrist motions, um, Okay. Things like that will help get that inflammation out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he, he'll do like uh, these exercises, I think, that mm -hmm. he gets frustrated that he can't, like the pinkies of them, he can't do if he has trouble, I think, even with the index for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. And he'll like kind of like try and force it. And I'm like, I don't know if you should be forcing it like that. You know, yeah. going to if it's coming up against that inflammation if, if even yeah that, which is I guess what I'm saying yeah I think it is because they get so swollen that he can't do it it's more that than um and then maybe we need to think about having him see someone who can manually get some of that swelling out when it gets that bad so I'm gonna actually talk to a massage therapist today Elizabeth and see if she can do some of that kind of inflammation reduction massage work or what her specialty is. Yeah. So that we'd have another person on board who could do that. And that would be great. Okay. So, yeah. Gentle things, gentle squeezing. We'll try and remember to start doing that with him. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'll do that with him too. I didn't know he had any um, hands stuff. The only thing that I notice when he does the reformer uh, hands and straps, he um, just like really grips. And then even sometimes bridging, he likes to hold like most the, the side. And I'm just, yes, yeah, it's hard to, he wants to work so hard. to just drink it and relax. Yeah. That's one thing he's mentioned is the um, grabbing the straps is sometimes harder than the handles. And so if you can switch out the handles. Um, oh yeah, 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 good idea, yeah. A little easier for him. The, the handle and is then, new for him. It's, it's uh, I think it's been the last few, few months that it's, he's got some really inflammatory arthritis basically. Um, um, up. So. Yeah, I've worked on it manually. Um, with him when it first started we had to send him around the block and figure it all out but um, and the manual work did seem to help some too when they get really flared up so maybe I will reach out and see if we can also get that going again for him so that it's um, not as bad yeah yeah hey. yeah okay next Patient. <laughs> um, so yeah, she uh, 
So this client has, like I said, we're starting with the feet and moving up. Um, she, she presents with a leg length difference, but I suspect it's something to do with her instability oh, um, in the hip. <clears throat> um, and so the left, left ankle is what's collapsing inward. She fights it all the time. So you can see she's like constantly working to pick it up. Um, and maybe that was just because I, my eyes were on her and she was very aware of it. But um, mm -hmm. she seems really aware of kind of what's going on. It's just like the trying to get it to be fixed. Um, so I gave her like a bunch of <laughs> uh, ankle and foot exercises that she could do um, between the last time I saw her and the next time I see her. Um, and just figured we would start with that. And I, she tires really easily um, on that ankle. So I kind of told her like, you know, just do 10 of these exercises and move on to the next one um, at a time. And, and mm -hmm. if you're going to the point where you're becoming inflamed and sore, back off a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I don't want her to start walking weirdly because of that yeah is that right yeah I totally agree and she may you know if there's so many things going on a lot of times I will recommend taping or bracing at that ankle and foot because it's just too much to keep track of right now so absolutely give her all those strengthening exercises I would have done the same but then if you want to be able to tackle anything else up the chain, you may want to recommend that maybe she tapes or if she knows how to tape it, or maybe she gets a brace. Those ASO braces are really great mm -hmm. just for really good stability um, in her shoe. Or if it's really just her ankle bone falling in, maybe it has to do more with her arch of her foot. And maybe that's all that she needs is to get that arch lifted. So that would be more of like an orthotic thing going on that uh, wouldn't help her when her shoes are off like when you're working with her potentially but um, it may just be that her arch needs to be taped up to help her hold stable on that ankle so yeah. it sounded um she mentioned some, some trauma like I say to that ankle um and she kind of offhand mentioned something about like a a bone either being out of place or or something okay. um, I, I need to ask her about that again she kind of just as a quip kind of said it um and I was busy thinking about all the other all the other things <laughs> I need to revisit that and see if there is something structurally wrong yeah yeah, and then maybe just ask, do you wear an orthotic? Have you ever taped or braced your ankle? This might be a good time just so that you can, she can work on it and be on it in the right alignment rather than being on it naturally in the wrong alignment. Right. So as she's, as everything else is trying, you're trying to work on everything else and then she's doing the exercises to strengthen it. So it's not that you're ignoring it. It's just that you're supporting it so that you can get to the rest of her. Right. as well okay yeah um and and do you think that starting with that ankle is the right way to go given all the other things going on or should i be thinking about the hip a little bit more you um you know i might even because it's acute and it's just been injured again sure yes but you might need to go to her pelvic region so She's, there may be some things that she's not supposed to be doing if she's having pelvic PT right now. So maybe ask her, are there things you're not supposed to do? She might, I don't know if, you know, some, there's two versions of what goes on wrong. One is that people get too tight and they can't release. And the other is people are too loose and they can't tighten. So it'd be good to know what she's working on, whether it's one or the other of those two. Because if it's a too tight and can't release, then you don't want to cue her lifting pelvic floor. You want to actually cue the release back 
Um, and if it's the opposite, then you definitely want to cue the lift, but you always have to re cue a release after. So just keep that in mind, right? Lift and then release. But you may want to go work on, get start getting some of that core stability going on so that you have something to build from. Because it sounds like things are going up and down wrong. So you may want to, now you've done the foot for a session, maybe recommend you know, if, if we could get some stability for this foot, then we can really focus on your center, which I think is going to help us strengthen both directions and make you feel better, both up towards your head and neck and down towards your leg and foot. So, um, and then maybe start working towards, you know, the basic pelvic stability series of exercises that are safe for whatever she has going on there. So, yeah. And then from there, you know, you might just go back and forth between it, but I think getting to that and strengthening there as soon as you can is a great idea. Okay. Yeah. And then everything built on top of it. So, and, and you know what I would say is sometimes when it's that complicated of a person, all I do is I take a step back and go, okay, what is the most pressing? I wanna make sure that the client feels heard her ankle was the most pressing so you had to address that in the first session you want that you want them to know that they were heard but then sometimes I just take a step back and go the bottom line is that the way that people get better is when their alignment is right right so maybe take a step back when it feels like you're kind of down in the mud and through trying to wade through all these different things going on take a step back take a look at her again standing posture, even just take a minute and say, you know, I want to see how you stand again. Would you mind just standing there for a minute? Let me just have a look front, turn side, turn back. Sometimes I have them stand there a lot longer than I need to, to actually see them, but long enough that I see them, but I can actually think for a minute or two about what is it that I'm seeing and where is it coming from kind of thing. Start having that dialogue in my own head. And then you can look at that posture and go, okay, what is the worst thing I see here? Let me go get that. Because if I can align the body, everything's going to feel better. So sometimes that's the approach I take when it's uh, a lot and you can't figure out where to start or stop. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Because <laughs> I felt like it was just like an avalanche of things. And I was like, I don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then you just take a step back, look and say, what's the most pressing? And then, you know, I keep watching when they're moving and I have these moments of like, okay, that explains something or aha, that is what's going on here. I see her moving on the reformer, for example. And I think, oh, that makes sense for that. Oh, now I see what's happening here. You know, you start to put the pieces together by almost taking a step back away and not focusing on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also for her, I was trying to remember for whiplash, what, I mean, head up, probably not a good idea. Um, right. And anything that's really going to aggravate the neck. Um, but I was, I couldn't quite remember all the, Contraindications. Yeah, contraindication is usually loaded flexion. Um, whiplash is a general, really big general thing. So, without more information, what your assumption should be is uh, potential facet joint damage, irritation from the mm -hmm. fast extension, flexion, muscular spasming. And if it's a chronic thing, there's a lot of weakness usually. So, and the spinal curve gets undone, right? Straightens a bit. The, you, the cervical curve starts to straighten. So finding again, length, finding great posture in the head and neck, and I would avoid head up anything. I would, and then the overload, there's all this protective mecha mechanism usually going on. So sometimes doing that little towel under the back of the head is good to just turn it off. And the thing that really helps release a lot of times is coccyx curl because you can release just through the pelvic motion, letting that release happen. And then what's really good for that is um, all fours are prone work at first because that helps align, helps strengthen these 
neck flexors, which often turn off after a whiplash type of accident. And then, um, then you can also work on stretching the back, those little uh, capitae muscles in the back without putting a lot of strain on there. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Thank you guys for coming with questions. I love that. That's really good because we can, you know, just talk through real scenarios and talk about things that seem really relevant to what's going on with everybody. Yeah. Great. Is there anything else you wanted to cover or talk about? I can tell you. Um, sorry, let me just remind myself yeah, what next week's. The theme this week was challenge your balance. I actually had a lot of fun with them in class. I gave them some really hard <laughs> things just for fun. Like on the roller, I I have them taking both legs to tabletop, laying along the roller and toe tapping down and trying to really keep the hands light. And then, and then I said, well, and then if you get really good, you might be able to lift the hands up a little bit even and move from one side to the other. And then I had them put the ball underneath their sacrum and try and do balance work there. And then we did a lot in standing, um, balance work in standing with leg moving, with leg out. We did uh, arabesque, seesaw arabesque. On um, Tuesday, I did it with no theraband. And on today, I did it with a theraband under the foot opening out arms. So, um, we did calf raises on the TheraBand with the holding down, which is actually, if you've never tried that, it's really interesting to me how you can feel. So if you do calf raises, just calf raises, not holding on to anything on both feet, but then you get a TheraBand and you step on it and you I make it pretty tight. So it's pulling you down, right? So I had it in my arms uh, while I was standing and it was pulling my shoulders down, kind of getting me into my lap and hold that there and then calf raise, it's amazing how much more balance you have if you're connected because it helps you connect your lats, helps you connect your center to that calf raise. So if you haven't tried it, and then they, and then I had them, for those that wanted to try on single leg in that same position. And it's really amazing how much more control some of them could get with having that bare bend under their feet. So just something fun to play with. Zanex, so that was, you yeah. Shot that? Yeah, let me show you. Okay, so I took the band and I placed it on the floor, put the balls of my feet on it. And then I just wrapped my hands in and bent. And this is a pretty strong band that I have. So um, I don't need to pull very much, but on a lighter band, you could pull some tension there. And then I stood here and I had them just go up and control their way down. And that connection through with the band, really, I'm, I feel so steady here. Right. And then I can really control that down motion. And then going to one leg, I have, well, I'm not as good on this foot, sorry. <laughs> but there's just this sense of control that I have with this that's different than if I don't. I feel more wobbly uh, without it. I should have done my right foot, that's better, but whoa, on one foot. Yeah, so I have this, it's, it's just interesting how when you're all connected through here and through here, you can really feel control even in something like a calf raise or in balance. I was trying to help them make that connection through the body and how when this is all doing its job that the whole body is more balanced. So that was the theme this week. And then next week we are on to, oh, the shoulders are connected to the rib cage. Mm. So um, the idea there was for, to make that connection of what happens when you have your shoulder in the right place, how is that different from the rib cage, and how do we work rib cage and shoulders both? So you know how sometimes when you tell people to lap pull down, their whole chest sticks out and their back arches. 
right? How do you make that connection shoulders to rib cage? And when your arm goes overhead, people arching off, right? How do you make that connection of what is going on shoulders to rib cage there that's creating that movement? What usually they don't even realize, right? So I wanted to be able to associate rib cage and shoulders together, show them all the places, even things like when hands are behind the head, if the shoulders go up, it changes how my rib cage sits. With, when I can, if I can bring my hands behind and lower the shoulders, right? That's a different positioning here through the rib cage too, than if I go up here. So just drawing attention to all those places where the shoulders and rib cage are fighting each other or when they can help each other and when you need to be conscious of what they're each doing separately. So that was my goal. That's my goal for next week. Mm, interesting. I'm trying to think of um, how I could integrate that into just a reformer class because, you know, that's those common mistakes happen in reformer, you know, the, the lap pulls and just going yes. down and just getting that. Yeah. It's very, it's very vulnerable moving parts there. Yeah. A lot of times when I want to introduce a theme, what I do is I break it into pieces. So for example, you might have them take the lap pull down and then have them purposely shrug up and reach down and shrug up and reach down. So I'm just creating that lift and lower motion. You know that that lift is sometimes that becomes the faulty motion sometimes with, with exercise and lap pulls. But if you draw awareness to the fact that they can actually move up and move down, they have that feeling. And then you say, okay, now let your arms go up, lat pull down, but keep the shoulders at that down position that we just had. Oh, so then, yeah. right? So you can break up and then you could go from there. Okay, we've got that down position. Now keep that down position as your arms are moving. Now just feel what is happening at your rib cage, right? Two things can happen. You can keep thinking of the rib cage, let the rib cage drop as your arm goes up, or your rib cage might be coming up with you as you come up, which one's happening? Then can you try keeping the rib cage down, right? So in, it, piece by piece, a lot of times is how I tack on one thing over another, over another, bring awareness to the areas of the body and then start tacking on. And then there's a lot on the reformer, like all the rowing seated long box, but even better if you ask me is the prone long box. If you can, if they're strong enough to do that, because then you can, they can feel when their rib cage flares, right? And you can keep the box is kind of holding them steady. So you can work more on the shoulder. They can't go too far with the rib cage out if their rib cage is blocked by the box. Mm. And then you get to work things like the presses away with a neutral rib cage and then swanning. Ooh. What happens with the shoulders and rib cage and swanning, right? So the shoulder blades have to slide down. You have to allow the front rib cage to open, but you don't want to just collapse and fall, right? You're trying to connect shoulder in the socket, allowing the rib cage to stretch in the front, but the tips, bottoms of the rib cage staying down and then reversing away, mm -hmm. right? So there's some really nice, nice, nice things you could use um, on the reformer to work on that theme if, if you're interested in it yeah yeah fact, I mimic a lot of the reformer stuff so we'll use the roll I'll use the roller have them put their hands on the roller and roll up to swan and roll down and we'll do the roller overhead just shoulder blades shrugging a lot I do that a lot um, and then I do what I call now sphinx pose where they're sort of pulling elbows down a little bit on their tummy prone so that they can lift the rib cage and drop the shoulder and find that position. So it's not swan and it's not flat and it's not on elbows. It's somewhere in between all of those. Um, and I find that, that then there they can keep pulling forward their bodies while they're trying to hold the position and still have some lift in the ribs. So it's a great place to just work on where are my shoulders, where are my ribs? What happens if I go like this What hap and let my ribs go? What happens if my shoulders shrug at you? They can really feel that connection. So, yeah. Yeah, those are, those are great suggestions. I, mm -hmm. 
Well, I will. Uh, I couldn't remember all of it to write down, but I'll, I'll get the I'll like get the first one, the shoulder shrug, especially because if their arms are down, it's um, you know they have that weight in their hands, and then they can kind of like really feel that like bot in their body, like oh oh yeah, that doesn't feel good. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. or they can feel the difference. That yeah. I think sometimes the point. The problem is solved if they have awareness around what's happening, but sometimes it, they just go in a position they don't even have that awareness yet. Yeah, they just so, want to. They just want to go. And just yeah. get them to rest. Yeah. <laughs> one, yes. One I've I've been doing in my virtual Mac classes the um, chest expansion with the band, <clears throat> and like I'll pause. On the first one and I'll have them you know like pull back um, and pull the shoulder blades together on their back and then soften the ribs downward um, and I'll usually say like to create like a long sternum or something like that and that seems to be effective um, like people seem to sort of grasp what that that one is but it's always that like first pull back of like you know jetting the ribs yeah. out <laughs> you know and then like okay now like think about your ribs and like what are they doing and pull them a little more underneath you um yeah that's just me. yeah there's a lot of there's a lot going on when you ask somebody to squeeze shoulder blades onto their back it's really hard for people to understand how to do that without what you just said it's really sticking out the ribs in the front and so if you draw, I think that's great to draw awareness. Sometimes you have to pick your battle. You're not gonna get both things going. So what's more important? Is it a shoulder issue and you need to get the shoulder blades back and then later you're gonna worry about strengthening there and figuring out the rib cage? Or is it um, that they're hypermobile and they're fine and you're not gonna worry too much about the shoulders? You know, sometimes you have to do one or the other, but trying to put it together is the point of next week. So I think that would be a great, great queuing um, and maybe finding a way. So getting that serratus press going so they feel shoulder blades together, shoulder blades apart, or even trying to do a little rhomboid rowing with intentional without queuing the rib cage first, maybe the bent elbow version is a little easier to feel the shoulder blades move on their back and then say, okay, now arm straight, shoulder blades first. Oh, don't lose the ribs, you know, <laughs> drop them back down or something to, to get them there. Um, I did something with uh, our elder client. Um, I don't know if it was last week or what, but um, because he's one of those people who, you know, he's there all the time. Um, and I wanted him to be able to kind of get some movement back there. And so I put him on the Cadillac uh, for serratus press, but I had him push into it and then uh, like pull his shoulder blades together underneath with the, the weight of the bar kind of aiding in that mm. and then sliding through again and just going through that because I don't know if you've noticed Allegra, but he like, he doesn't the, pull the shoulder blades together is like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? He doesn't have, he, I don't think just doesn't have that awareness back there. Yeah, no, that's good. You kind of snuck it in there. Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of an interesting one and he struggled with it a little bit, but um, it just reminded me of what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind is sometimes I'll put people on the roller and have them take their cells out, their arms out into the pec stretch kind of position and then squeeze the roller with their shoulder blades. Mm. That's a nice one too, to sometimes get that, just to have that feeling of what's happening with the shoulder blades and get some movement back there or move awareness of movement back there because they get the feedback of, oh, I can actually squeeze the roller with my shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. So that might be, and I don't think that would work for him specifically, but it might be a nice one to try sometime too. If somebody's having a hard time yeah. 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 Great. Well, thanks you guys so much for hanging yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. It's all virtually. It's like our own TV yeah. show here. It's our own TV show. We've got our own TV show going on. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'll see you ladies soon.